If you are worried you have Lyme disease, or just like the outdoors, and want the peace of mind of knowing whether you have Lyme disease or not, there is a new Lyme screening test based on decades of research by Dr. Richard Marconi, a professor at VCU Medical Center. For more information, visit glymedx.com. That's G-L-Y-M-E-D-X.com. Or email at info at glymedx.com. Infectious diseases, research, medicine, health. Welcome to Outbreak News Interviews. And now, broadcasting from the Outbreak News Skylar Studios in beautiful West Central Florida, here is your host, microbiologist and editor of OutbreakNewsToday.com, Robert Harriman. Well, hey, everybody, this is Robert, and welcome to the latest episode of Outbreak News Interviews. And this year marks the 100th anniversary of the 1918 influenza pandemic, history's worst epidemic, which accounted for more deaths than World War I and World War II combined. Joining me for a little history about the 1918 outbreak is historian John M. Barry. John is the author of the book, The Great Influenza, and I encourage you to check it out if you never did. It's a good read. Hey, John, and welcome to the show, sir. Uh, thanks. Glad to be here. Thank you, sir. Now, let's start out with the genesis of this outbreak. What do we really know? You know, Where did it start, and how long did it last? Well, there are different hypotheses about where it started. Uh, we will probably never really know. It, it could have been in Asia, or it could have been in France, it could have been in Kansas. Uh, it, the all, all influenza viruses have a natural reservoir in birds. They're all bird flu, uh, but the virus mutates as pretty much as rapidly as anything in existence, and that gives it the ability to jump species. Um, so that has happened as far as we look back in history. It will happen as far as we go forward. When a new influenza virus enters the human population, that's when you get a pandemic. Uh, seasonal influenza, the virus mutates rapidly as well, but that's what, and that's why you need a uh, different vaccine every year because the the virus changes but your immune system still has some uh, ability to recognize it. Uh, and, but a new virus is, is, is quite different, will usually spread more explosively uh, and, and may or may not be more lethal than ordinary influenza. Obviously, in 2009, we had a pandemic. Uh, my guess is there were probably many events throughout history just like that, that passed without notice because that outbreak was quite mild, even milder than ordinary seasonal influenza. I think we only picked it up because we have modern technologies, molecular biology and so forth, and the ability to to identify the virus. Uh, however, there were also pandemics in 1957 and 1968. They were nothing like 1918, but but they were... Uh, certainly a lot worse than 2009. And then in 1918, we had the mother of all infectious disease outbreaks. Uh, it probably killed between 50 and 100 million people. And if you adjust for a population, that would be between roughly 225 million to 450 million people in today's world. Uh, obviously, modern medicine has, uh, you know, is light years ahead of the ability of medicine to treat infectious disease back then. So many, uh, many people's lives would be saved, but it would not solve the problem uh, for a lot of reasons that we could go into. I mean, we are still extremely vulnerable to a severe pandemic. So, uh, John, b based on the, all the research that you've done, though, as a historian, where do you think it started? Well, I, I advanced a hypothesis in the book uh, 
that it started in rural Kansas. Uh, but since the book came out, there's been, you know, a lot of scientific investigation of the virus, which suggests that the virus was around before, you know, my hypothesis. Uh, it, it, you know, it's not conclusive. Uh, it doesn't entirely kill the idea of Kansas, but uh, it does weaken that hypothesis. As I said, nobody knows. There are, there are theories that Vietnamese workers crossed North America on their way to World War I, and they brought it. There are theories that it started in a, in a army camp, British Army camp in France in 1915, 1916. Uh, we really don't know. And um, from from start to finish, I mean, as best as you can you can tell me, how long did this pandemic last? Well, the there were some spring 1918 outbreaks that were hit or miss. In fact, it was a lot like 2009. There were some cities where it was somewhat explosive, even in 2009, uh, and there are other cities that. It didn't hit at all. In, in the United States, for example, New York had a very pronounced spring uh, wave. Uh, Los Angeles didn't record a single death in the spring. Uh, you know, but that first spring wave was was not the killer. Uh, partly because it didn't infect as many people. Partly because the uh, case mortality wasn't as high. Uh, the the virus did change, and then in the fall. That was a killing wave. Probably two thirds of all the deaths occurred uh, in probably about 12 weeks uh, between late September and December 1918. Then there was a third wave that came uh, January through April in 1919, uh, which was also pretty lethal by any standard except the second wave. Uh, after that, the virus calmed down and became ordinary seasonal influenza. So ballpark 15 months or so? Uh, something like, actually, yeah. almost exactly uh, a year. Okay. All right. Um, John, what was the reaction among the medical community at this time in 1918? Well, you had different. First, you had the research community, uh, which was energized. And I mean, the scientists back then were were quite capable. They didn't have the tools that we have. They didn't have the knowledge base that we have. But they, they were great scientists. Uh, sure. For example, one of the uh, characters in the book, Paul Lewis, had proved that polio was a viral disease uh, back in, I think, 1905, 1906, and then produced a vaccine that was 100% protective of monkeys uh, before 1910. Uh, another scientist, Oswald Avery, uh, continued studying pneumonia after the influenza outbreak. Of course, that's what most people died of, pneumonia, either viral or bacterial. And he ended up discovering that DNA carried the genetic code, which is arguably the most important finding in the biological sciences in the 20th century. Uh, so, but of course, they also had limitations. Number one, they didn't know what a virus was exactly in, in 1918. Uh, they didn't know if it was a simply a really, really small bacteria and functioned like a bacteria or whether it was a different kind of organism. Uh, there had been a very prominent German scientist named Pfeiffer who thought he had proven the cause of influenza. He was wrong. Uh, it was the, he, it, named the the uh, pathogen Bacillus influenza, name, now it's called Haemophilus influenza, even though it has nothing to do with influenza, but that's the name. Uh, so it was very difficult for them to develop vaccines, and they, they did have vaccine technologies back then, uh, but, well, it wasn't difficult, it was impossible because they didn't have the right pathogen. Uh, even today, our ability to develop a good vaccine against influenza is extremely limited uh, because the virus mutates so rapidly. I'm not sure if people realize how relatively ineffective 
influenza vaccines are. I mean, in the last 15 years or so, they've ranged from 10% effective to 61% effective uh, compared to vaccines against other diseases, which are in the high 90s percent effectiveness. It's, you know, it's a totally different ballpark. I think a lot of people are recognizing that shortcoming this year, as a matter of fact. Yeah, uh, a lot of people will say about the not a great match uh, this year, which is why. Well, well, okay, go ahead. Well, I'm sorry, sorry. Well, I was just going to say uh, it's really why we need to devote resources to a uh, universal vaccine, one that that will work against all influenza viruses, and there has been enough progress towards that to suggest that it can be achieved, but we have not put resources into that pursuit over the last few decades when we should have done it. Yeah, I, I saw that uh, several senators put out a uh, piece of legislation called the Flu, Flu Vaccine Act, basically, specifically to, to, to take care of that one issue of getting a universal flu vaccine out there. We'll see where it goes. Um, John, this this pandemic occurred during World War One. Um, how did the war affect the pandemic? Well, I don't really think it had a lot of effect on it, uh, other than the public health. Well, I'm, in terms of its spread, I don't think it had the, a lot of impact. Uh, I think in terms of the public health response, it had a tremendous impact. Uh, because of the war, uh, European nations were censoring the press. In the United States, they didn't technically censor it, but they did, uh, the U.S. government did create a propaganda arm, something called the Committee for Public Information, and at the heart of this was the idea that, and this is a direct quote from the architect of this, the truth or, or falsehood are arbitrary terms. It matters little if something is true or false. All that matters is whether it can move people. Uh, so that was the attitude the government took toward giving people information. And in an effort to keep morale up, uh, bad news was discouraged, of course, serious illness was bad news. So you had national public health leaders say, this is ordinary influenza by another name. It was known as Spanish flu. I mean, one thing we do know is it did not start in Spain. There was no influenza in Spain until not, until May, long after a lot of outbreaks elsewhere. But Spain was not at war, and its press was writing about the disease at length, and the king got sick. So it, it became known as, as Spanish flu. Anyway, the, you've got national public health leaders saying this is ordinary influenza by another name. And local public health leaders are, are echoing that you have nothing to worry about, don't get scared, so forth and so on. But at the same time, <laughs> excuse me, people are seeing their neighbors or their spouse die sometimes within 24 hours of the first symptom, sometimes with horrific symptoms. Uh, people were turning so dark blue from lack of oxygen, you know, do doctors were saying they couldn't tell uh, black patients from white patients. Uh, some people were bleeding not only from their nose and mouth, but, but actually from their ears and even their eyes. Uh, th th these are... <laughs> pretty, pretty frightening symptoms. I can't imagine something more frightening. And at the same time, their leadership and the political uh, leaders, as well as public health, are saying, this is, you know, don't worry about it. Well, pretty soon people stop listening. You know, they, they weren't that stupid. Uh, they knew this was not ordinary influenza by another name. Uh, and it the fact that they couldn't trust anybody, they couldn't trust their leadership to tell them the truth, it was extremely alienating. I, I think there were, in many parts of, of this country and, and probably in the world, according to the Red Cross, there was a fear akin to the plagues of the Middle Ages. You, you had instances 
where people were starving to death. <laughs> Excuse me. Uh, because nobody would bring them food. Uh, there was plenty of food, but even even in you know, there are cases where Blaine's his sister wouldn't wouldn't step near the house uh, where the family was ill, and you know that that is very unlike most disasters, uh, where in usually people come together and act heroically, and certainly there were some individuals who were heroic, and and doctors and nurses were almost universally heroic. They did not as a general rule, shrink from uh, trying to help people. Uh, but it, it was a different, it, it, would, it was, uh, in fact, let me give you an example. Philadelphia was one of the largest cities in the country, and uh, there was a doctor there, actually at the time he was a medical student, uh, who was working in an emergency hospital, and every day he drove home to the hospital uh, over 12 miles. And he saw so few cars on the road that he started counting them. And uh, one day in a city, one of the largest cities in the country, in a drive of 12 miles, he did not see one other car on the road. He said the life of the city has almost stopped. Uh, you know, the... In, uh, People who stayed home from work and so forth. I mean, absenteeism was extraordinarily high, even in war industries where where workers were told it was their patriotic duty to go to work. Uh, so I mean, people were frightened, and and society began to disintegrate. Frankly, uh, and that's not an overstatement. There is uh, I, I quoted. Uh, a guy named Victor Vaughn, who had been the dean of the University of Michigan Medical School, uh, and like many, many others, uh, when the war started, he became a, an officer, and he was the head of the Army's Division of Communicable Diseases. <clears throat> and he uh, commented that, this is a direct quote, if the current rate of acceleration continues for a few more weeks, civilization could easily disappear from the face of the earth, unquote. And, you know, he was commenting on the uh, disintegration of society, the amount of fear out there. So, it, it, so John, um, I want to piggyback on, you were talking a little bit about the public trust in the government. Um, how, how did Woodrow Wilson and the Sedition Act play into all that? Well, they, they're, the law you just cited, uh, and there were actually a couple of laws. One said that uh, or made it punishable by 20 years in prison uh, for criticizing the government. And this was something that was actually enforced. Uh, a congressman was sentenced to 15 years uh, in jail for criticizing the government, a congressman. Uh, there were basically, uh, you know, informers for the J Justice Department who were given badges. There were more than 100,000 of them uh, who were out there reporting any disloyal statements. Uh, so this, in fact, when, when a newspaper in Wisconsin uh, started printing the truth about the pandemic and the, and the death tolls. Uh, an army general actually began prosecution of them, started the process anyway to prosecute them for violating uh, some of these laws, although that prosecution was dropped as the pandemic proceeded. But that was the attitude toward the truth back then, probably considerably worse than at any other time in our history. Yeah, it's very frightening. Um, let me ask you about uh, the actual strain. Um, unlike this flu season, which is, you know, most devastating on the very young and the, and the older, um, this affected mostly young adults. And what made this particular strain so pathogenic? Well, they're still asking that question, and, you know, we've, of course, not we, I mean, the scientific community has sequenced the genome and 
we can reconstruct it and so forth, and we have some ideas, but we, we really don't know exactly. I think the best hypothesis as to why this tended to kill people between 20 and 40, uh, which was probably two-thirds of the deaths were certainly under 65, and, and most of those were between 20 and 40, which is very unlike uh, most influenza outbreaks when 93% of the dead are over 65. Uh, anyway, the most likely hypothesis is that th the immune systems of the young adults uh, are much more robust than for the elderly, and if the virus was in the lung, then the immune system was launching every weapon it had to kill the virus, it, and the battlefield was the lung. Uh, so it was kind of like that Vietnam commander who said we had to destroy the village to save it. Uh, the immune system was destroying the lungs <laughs> to try to defeat the virus. Uh, so I, I think that is the hypothesis that is the leading one and the one that makes the most sense to me. Right. Um, and let me go ahead and close with this, and I want an opinion from you. Um, John, you, you clearly are an expert in this. How vulnerable are we to a similar pandemic, and what have we learned from the 1918 pandemic? Well, we're extremely vulnerable. Um, as we were discussing earlier, the best vaccine is a 60% effective. It would not be effective against <laughs> a new pandemic virus. It would take, at this point, at least five or six months to develop a vaccine in, in a best case. And even then, there's no reason to think it would be any more effective than the vaccines that, are, uh, that we have now against seasonal flu. In addition, uh, you know, although medical care is infinitely better if you, than it was then, if you have an individual isolated case, you can practically perform miracles. For example, in the 2009 pandemic, which did hit some people with great severity, uh, you, you had people in ICUs uh, where the blood was actually taken out of their body because their lungs weren't functioning and the blood was oxy oxygenated outside the body and then recirculated uh, until the people's lungs recovered. I mean, they couldn't do anything like that in 1918, but how many beds are there in a hospital where, that's, where you're capable of doing something like that? And what happens when the doctors are sick? What happens when the nurses are sick? What happens with just-in-time inventory systems when you run out of syringes? What happens when you run out of antibiotics? Uh, even today, uh, uh, when you get a bac secondary bacterial infection, uh, pneumonia, following influenza, the case mortality is about 8%. That is a very high number. It's obviously a lot lower than it was in 1918, but 8% is, is, is still frightening. But that's with modern ICUs. That's with antibiotics. When you get a uh, pandemic, it, it hits like a tsunami. You get, it easily could be 30% of the population sick pretty much at the same time, and it simply would overwhelm the healthcare system, and it would, if you get sick very early and you have access to good healthcare, you're going to have a much better chance of recovery than if you get sick a little bit later after all the hospital beds are full, after the antibiotic supplies are gone, and after the doctors and nurses get sick themselves. So we are extremely vulnerable. Uh, there are lessons that came out of 1918. Uh, I, I was one of many people who participated in trying to figure out uh, what public health measures you could take to mitigate the uh, pandemic somewhat, and they came up with what are referred to as non-pharmaceutical interventions. In other words, what do you do when you don't have any drugs?
and you know there are some things that you know the first is to tell the truth I think every plan at the national level that I know of has incorporated that message from 1918 that uh, lying to people is is not the best way to go that if you that if you expect the public to pay any attention to you you need to be candid with them that's number 1 number 2 there there are a lot of things that would in combination possibly take the edge off a pandemic and save lives. Uh, all of those would be on the CDC website, and a lot of them are very fundamental. Uh, Matt, you know, going down things like washing your hands, uh, putting a mask on somebody who's sick, Matt, wearing a surgical mask when you're healthy is not going to do much of anything. However, if you're in a household, and somebody is sick, and if you put a mask on the sick person, that will contain uh, a lot of what he or she might cough up, and it would protect people around them. Uh, you know, there, there are other things that, that can be done as well. I mean, one that is sort of counter the way culture works, uh, you know, we are sort of taught if we're sick, to go into work unless we really, really, really can't handle it. Well, that is not the right way to behave in a pandemic of influenza. If you're sick, you should stay home. I mean, that would be part of the messaging, things like that and other stuff. If the public did comply with the recommendations over a sustained period of time, then it would save a significant number of lives. But that hardly means that we're not vulnerable. Well, very interesting. Um, the, the book is The Great Influenza. When did that come out? 2004, uh, but 15 years ago? we actually uh, are about yeah. to come out with a brand new afterward, uh, updating it you know, through bird flu and through uh, the 2009 pandemic and some of the latest uh, uh, findings. Yeah, so I, I'm sure you're keeping a close eye on the H7N9 right. Right. Uh, China. Yeah, and also I, I read a pretty good article by John um, in the Smithsonian Magazine, I don't know, a few months ago. I encourage uh, listeners to check out the book and the article. And I want to thank you once again, John M. Barry, for your time and expertise. Uh, you're very welcome. It.